Welcome to the Aerospace Ambition Podcast with your co-hosts Kieran and myself, Marius. As aerospace engineers, our passion lies in sustainable aviation, especially at the crossroads of climate change and AI. In today's episode, we are excited to explore the details of Contrail Science with a distinguished expert in the area. Kieran, could you introduce our esteemed guest? Hello, Marius and listeners. Today, we're thrilled to have Professor Ian Pohl on the show. An eminent figure in aerospace engineering, widely respected across both academia and industry. Currently, he is Professor Emeritus at Cranfield University, and he was Chairman of the Defence Scientific Advisory Committee. He also holds leadership positions in the Royal Aeronautical Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering. Join us as we explore Professor Pohl's impactful journey in the world of aerospace engineering. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Kieran. So you've been an important voice in the aerospace research community for quite some time now. Well, I've been a voice for a long time. Whether it's been important or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just wondering if you could kick things off by giving us a bit of info on what you're currently up to. Okay, well, well let, let me give you a, um, a, year, a year or a decadal view on this. Um, for the first part of my career, I was interested in, in uh, aircraft performance. And about 20 years ago, I, I became involved in what was then sort of early environmental um, studies on, on, on uh, aviation and the environment, which, which really flowed from the first IPCC report on aircraft. And I, I became very interested in this because I realized that, that A, obviously, um, environment is very important, um, and B, the uh, relationship between the aircraft and the environment was not understood sufficiently well to make good choices about how you treat aviation in the environmental context. And for the past 20 years, I have been trying to develop a deeper understanding Basically, based on first principles, not not on on great big um, computational studies, but basically on on the the fundamental essence of the problem, to see if we could if we could expose the issue so that everybody could understand them. Nice, simple uh, take home messages, which could be proved uh, preferably on the back of a cigarette packet for those who still smoke. You know, you can do it nice and simply and it, it, it becomes convincing. That is easier said than done. <laughs> and 20 years later, um, we've made some progress. We've, we've got some uh, simple messages out there. Mm -hmm. And currently I'm working on building simple performance models for global fleets of aircraft so that the climate scientists can put aircraft into their atmospheric models, confident that the models, that the aircraft models are as good as their atmospheric models. Mm -hmm. Now that may sound a little strange, but the problem is because uh, there are lots of commercially confidential pieces of information around aircraft performance, yeah. estimating aircraft performance is not that simple because you can't use the information that is privy to the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. They obviously know how the things behave, but it's not public domain information. So I'm trying to produce things which are uh, purely public domain, which everybody can use so that everybody can get a can do research and get a better understanding of what's going on. So it's 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 an enabler for a wider group of people to get into aviation and the environment research. Sure. Because at the moment it's limited. I'm assuming you're referring to the Paul Schumann model. Yeah, that's the one that's currently being being used. Um, it's in COSIP as an option, and and it is one of the very few public domain methods. Can you perhaps brief the listeners on what this model does and maybe how it sets sets apart from other aircraft? On a pack of a cigarette. <laughs> oh, it's almost that simple, actually. Uh, what it does is it allows you at this stage, and I'll, I'll just qualify that by in its present form, it gives you the fuel flow rate um, for 
an aircraft of a given weight at a given height and a given speed. So when the trajectory is known and the trajectories are known from air traffic uh, sources, if you know what aircraft type is following that trajectory, then the PS method gives you um, its fuel burn and the, um, the efficiency of the engines. Okay. Gives you the top level performance criteria. Uh, in development is a better model, which will actually allow you to crawl inside the engine as well and get the pressures and temperatures inside the engine at the critical places. Wow. And we need that so that we can start to develop particulate models. So we have the, the gas emissions under control. So we can do the carbon dioxide. We can do the nitrogen dioxide. We can do the water vapor. Mm -hmm. uh, the next challenge is to get the particulates accurately modeled. And that requires detailed engine information. I guess that sort of brings me on to um, the question which we received from Mark Shapiro just in last episode. So he had a question for you. Oh, did and he? he wanted to know how air aircraft performance may affect downstream contrail radiative forcing and climate impact. He's interested to understand exactly how we might be able to non-dimensionalize contrail yeah. climate impact in an aircraft performance model. Well, the aircraft performance model uh, is is entirely non-dimensionalized. In my, I, I work in a non-dimensional universe. Uh, it's just the way that uh, that I was brought up. Um, yeah, as far as I, I tend not to know too much about the contrail science because that is really, really highly specialized and complex. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I sit on the sidelines and I can see what's going on, <laughs> but, but, but you know, I leave that, that, that bit to others. What I can say from the aircraft's uh, perspective is that everything the climate scientists are asking for, we can eventually give them. Yeah. And we can be reasonably certain on the error bars for the data that's been handed across. And this is relatively new. The, the, the previous methods, you, you, you had black boxes and you could only take the numbers that came out. There was no, um, no hint as to what the accuracy might be or whether they were even accurate at all. You know, it was taken on trust. And if we're gonna do good science, you can't take things on trust. Yeah. You know, the, the, um, the Royal Society has a motto, um, which, which translates into accept no man's word. <laughs> and, and you can see where this is coming from. If you can't prove it, if you can't reproduce it yourself, if others can't see it, then the chances are it's not right. And so, you know, you just shouldn't take somebody's word for it. Maybe there's some sort of intersection between these new particulate models that you're building into the aircraft performance and non-dimensionalizing contrail climate impact. I'm sure there is. I mean, the universe is non-dimensional, of course. I mean, so yeah. <laughs> at the fundamental <laughs> level, it must be possible to do it. Um, now that's not suggesting it's easy. Um, mm. And this is one of the things I've learned. You know, you, the aircraft is, is a complicated system, mm -hmm. but it is a machine. And therefore, it, it does obey the laws of physics. Now, climate science is, is slightly different because there are, there are huge uncertainties in just about everything. Yeah. But an aeroplane is a machine, and therefore you ought to be able to extract its characteristics with known accuracy. Sure. Take it from me that going from a complex situation to a simple situation is very, very difficult. Anybody can go the other way. Anybody can make simple stuff complicated. But complex to simple takes a lot more proving and a lot more thinking and a lot more sweat than you might imagine. Right, for sure. And that's something that I think you really managed to do at the conference in, in September, going from complex to simple um, at the Aviation Climate Impact Mitigation by 2030 conference. And maybe you could just summarize, because I found it so helpful, the almost like a storyline that you told. You, you made it very high level and, and the statements were very easy to understand. What was your main message um, at this conference that you tried to convey to the audience? 
Okay, that, well, there, there, were, there were a few messages. The first was that a simplistic view of saying just stop flying is not a terribly sensible way to go. And my first explanation for that was because flying is not a frivolous activity. It is an underpinning activity for global wealth creation. Now, environmental problems are big problems, and big problems need lots and lots of money to fix them. And so if you are not, if you don't have healthy economies with, with growing gross domestic product, then you can't afford to solve the problems of the climate. And since aviation is an important enabler for GDP growth, then if you took it out of the um, equation, you, <laughs> you would be denying yourself the ability to solve the problem. And it, this doesn't just apply to aviation. This is, this is one of the big dilemmas. When people just say, oh, stop doing something, they have no concept of what that really means. You know, the world around us isn't just about um, uh, fuel. The world around us is made of stuff which comes from oil, plastics, just about everything you touch. <laughs> and if you, if you were to say, right, no more oil, then we would literally be pushing civilization back into the Middle Ages, if not further. You know, so it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a much deeper problem. And the issues are interlinked in, a, in a, a complicated way. But the high level message is we have to manage what we're doing. We have to generate wealth so that we can solve the problem. And if we don't have, have these things properly aligned, then we won't be moving forward as societies and as a civilization in general. I think it's definitely somewhere in the middle, isn't it? It's, it's a just and equitable transition but a rapid transition at that, something that needs to happen tomorrow or today. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and of course, the problem is, the problem is that, uh, you know, the world's population is growing and regrettably a, a big slug of that population is very poor. Hmm. And therefore, their natural desire to improve their standards of living means energy consumption is going up and up and up. And so it isn't just a matter of replacing what we have. We have to also provide for the future. You know, you, <laughs> it's, it's, you have to look at all these things at a global level. It's no good looking at them uh, just on a country by country basis. Sure. You know, I can give you an example for the UK. One of the ways in which we've reduced our CO2 is to stop making certain things, but buying them from China, <laughs> where China makes them by burning coal in coal-powered fire stations. It's completely nonsensical. <laughs> so, so although some group, some small group, may be able to claim that they have reduced their carbon footprint, if you take the control volume to be the earth, yeah. then the environment is worse off as a result. And there's an awful lot of this going on. Um, so we have to be very careful that we do take the big picture view. I like the sentence that you put out. I'm, I'm going to quote you here. Um, you said um, aviation is both part of the solution and part of the problem. I think that really uh, yes. nailed, nailed this um, notion. Would you say... Overly um, simplifying would also mean to, to manage the demand. So would that also, like this whole topic of demand management um, and reduction, is that also a, a way to oversimplify things that are actually very complex? Yes, of course. I mean, demand management would be a catastrophe. <laughs> I mean, you know, aviation, whilst, whilst it is a, a growth enabler, isn't a particularly... Um, high grossing business the margins in aviation are very small indeed and you know it, it's it's if you if you do anything which per perturbs the business models you run the risk of losing aviation not 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 just managing it or restricting it in certain ways but but losing it altogether 
and demand management would be bad. I mean, you know that that in the West, the, the, the business businesses are judged on their rate of growth. A business that does not grow is a bad business. And so if aviation is going to be a healthy business, it has to grow. And demand management would clearly be the antithesis of growth. And the consequences of that would be significant. You know, it's, we're, we're, we're not just talking about the, uh, the capability that aviation provides. We're talking about the people who work in aviation. We're talking about the manufacturers. We're talking about the whole system. The whole system would be would be uh, in a mess if if governments went to demand management. And actually, we're, hint- we're we're touching on something which is quite important here because when one looks at CO two and the solutions available to aviation for mitigating CO two, these are all very long term. And if something happened in the short term which caused governments to demand immediate action. Aviation has no immediate action available as we speak today. And consequently, the only thing that could be imposed will be demand management. And it's a very, very high risk. There's always the argument that like with demand management, you're potentially risking the entire industry. Yeah. But there's also the risk of climate impacts to the industry, which will only grow and grow over the next few decades and potentially lead to a complete crash of the industry anyway where do you sit on on that well well where i sit on that i mean this brings us nice and neatly to contrails is that surprise surprise there is something that can be done that can be done in the short term which has an immediate climate impact and which costs virtually nothing and which does not impact demand or restrict aviation in any way shape or form (laughs) Uh, it's it's that the solution is before us, you know. Now, perhaps this goes back to Marius's original question. Not a lot of people are aware of this. Um, and so, you know, everybody's aware of carbon dioxide and, and nobody's suggesting that uh, we shouldn't do everything we can to reduce carbon dioxide or even eliminate it altogether. Um, but um, there is something else we can do. There is another side to the problem, a site that's unique to aviation, and the solution uniquely is in aviation's own hands. If we speak a little bit more about the topic that you just opened up, very interesting topic of of contrails, contrail avoidance or management, we want to phrase it, then um, maybe you can give our audience uh, uh, just a broad overview. There are different kinds, right? You could, um, for example, close out entire airspaces or you could deviate uh, single flights. Also, you could make the intervention, for example, pre- in a pre-tactical manner before the takeoff. You could also do it during flight. Um, so what, what is the landscape of solutions that is out there at the moment? Before we talk about solutions, let, let me just describe the problem in, in, in some broad brush terms. Mm-hmm. The, the current consensus amongst climate scientists is that Aviation does three things to the environment. It uh, emits carbon dioxide, which we all understand is is bad and and all the rest of it. It also emits a cocktail of the oxides of nitrogen. And this is largely because to make an engine efficient, you want the combustion temperature to be high. But Mm. if you heat air to a sufficiently high temperature, it dissociates uh, into nitrogen and oxygen atomic form and when the recombination takes place it doesn't go back to nitrogen and oxygen molecules Mm. it goes back to a complex set of nitric uh, and nitrous oxide Mm. that's also that's greenhouse gas related and that's also bad but then the under the right atmospheric conditions the water vapor and particulates can produce a contrail now They'll produce a contrail based on the fuel in the aircraft if the air temperature is around about minus 40 degrees C or below. And that produces a little short contrail, a few kilometers long, and that's called a non-persistent contrail. However, if the aircraft happens to fly through a region of the air that is super saturated with respect to ice, and by that I mean 
that the dust levels and general particulates in the air are very low. The level of particulates is very, very low. And therefore, when the temperature drops, the water vapor in the air does not form ice crystals because to form an ice crystal, you need a particle on which to nucleate a drop of water so that it can freeze. So if, if there is no dust in the, in the atmosphere, the water vapor can exist at temperatures way below the normal freezing point. And such a region is completely transparent. You can't look up in the sky, you can't see it, it's, it's, it's clear. Mm -hmm. If the aircraft now flies through one of those regions, the particulates in the exhaust gas form the nuclei for those droplets. And what happens then is water vapor precipitates out of the, uh, of the air and forms a very, very long contrail. The ones you see that go from horizon to horizon, um, you know, these are hundreds of kilometers long and they contain millions to tens of millions of tons of water. So they're a major atmospheric event. And these things, when you create them, can also, over time, a few hours, turn into high-level cirrus cloud, more or less indistinguishable from other clouds. Mm. But what does a cloud do? Well, a cloud and a, or a, and a contrail, once formed, if it's nighttime, they absorb heat coming from the surface of the Earth. They, they trap it. Heat that would normally be radiated back out into space gets caught by the ice crystals because the ice crystals are cold. So no surprise there. OK, so that acts like a thermal blanket. That is a, an atmospheric warming. During the day, if it's, a clear, if it's clear and the sunshine is hitting the tops of the contrails or the contrail cloud, no cloud in between, then the contrail can reflect sunlight back into space. It still absorbs heat coming from the surface. That doesn't stop, but the, the crystals reflect light. That's why you can see them in the sky. That's why they're visible. And sometimes that reflected sunlight, uh, the energy can be greater than the absorbed energy from the ground. And so our contrails can either be warmers, like they are at night, or sometimes they can be coolers, like they are during the day. Mm -hmm. Now, currently with operations, the net effect of all contrails formed is a warming effect. And the warming effect is as big as the CO2 effect, so the consensus goes. So it's massive. In fact, roughly a sixth is due to NOx, a third is due to CO2, and a half of it is due to contrails. Mm -hmm. um, now, okay, climate science has lots of uncertainties in it, but you know, as a as a take-home message, a sixth, a third, a half is roughly where we are. We can't, we know the problem with CO2, its solution is long term. But if contrails and contrail cirrus are every bit as large as the CO2, then why on earth don't we get rid of the contrails and the contrail cirrus? Because that would halve um, aviation's climate impact at a stroke. Mm -hmm. And again, you see, going back to the bigger picture, it's the total climate impact that matters. It's not all about co2 you know if aviation's doing far more than the general public appreciate and therefore it should be a matter of some concern let's you know put it no more strongly than that now the good news is that it's relatively easy to stop making contrails because you only have to avoid the regions of the air that are supersaturated with respect to ice. These regions occur predominantly in, predominantly in the northern latitudes. They occur round about the tropopause, so 35,000 feet typically. Mm. They extend laterally for hundreds of kilometers, but they're only a couple of thousand feet thick. It's possible to avoid them by small changes in altitude up or down. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have a problem and we have a solution and it's, it's an operational solution. It doesn't require any, any new technology, any new fuels, any, it just requires the 
super saturated regions to be in the weather forecast so that the flight planners can avoid them either by uh, horizontal uh, deviation or simply by the small vertical deviations. Hmm. It's as simple as that. The, the, the difficulty today is that it's not so easy to forecast those regions terribly accurately. One of the reasons for that is that nobody has asked for that information before. So it's not as if it's you know some phenomenally difficult problem. It's simply the customer has never requested the information. Mark touched on that last episode. He said that like measuring the atmos- the atmospheric parameters at these high altitudes and modeling the state of the atmosphere at such high altitudes is it hasn't been done historically because there hasn't necessarily been a huge need to. Now we've come across this big problem where everybody wants to avoid contrails and it's come to a point now where we don't really have the accurate forecast to do that. Well, well do we not? I mean, here, here's an interesting question. Um, the reason that contrails were researched in the first place was a military one uh, based on the need to avoid detection. Yeah. And, and in fact, all these nice stealthy aircraft that we built today ain't so stealthy if they form contrails. So guess what, Kieran? They have weather forecasts telling them how to avoid these things. The, the point I'm making is that the, we have 100 years' worth of research on contrail avoidance in the military domain. And, and thus far, there hasn't been a, a unification of the military and civil domain. But you know, it, in fact, in fact, the the Schmidt Appleman criterion. <laughs> Schmidt produced this in 1940, and you can probably guess what you know the uh, the motivation for the work. So, so <clears throat> it, it's 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 not as new as you might think. Yeah, but I guess the the novelty comes with predicting the climate impact of these contrails so whether they're cooling or warming and the evolution over time like whether they stay a warming contrail or it goes from nighttime to daytime and they go from being a warming contrail to a cooling contrail and being able to really accurately predict that is seemingly a very very difficult task so maybe you could touch on exactly what factors do determine this cooling or warming effect yeah well it's the the principal factor is is whether or not you're in daylight yeah because if you're at night there's no chance um the difficulty is well I, let's not use the word difficulty i i mean it, it ain't that difficult to stop making them because the, the beauty of contrails is you can see them and when i say see uh, sometimes you can see them from the ground but you can always now it seems see them on satellites from above <laughs> so if you said we want to stop making contrails you would be able to tell immediately whether or not you've been successful mm. now i don't know of any other environmental uh, impact where you can where you can do that i mean you know co2 nobody knows what co2 looks like it doesn't look like anything you you, you, you get no manifestation of its effects but with contrails, you most certainly do. And the, I mean, the, the, the early in the morning, certainly in, in the latitudes that we live in, you see the, the sky crisscrossed with, with contrails. And those contrails are the good ones. Those are the ones that are cooling. Okay. So you could, you could look up in the sky in the early morning, and if it's full of contrails, you'll know that they're doing a good job. <laughs> if it's devoid of contrails, You've missed an opportunity. I mean, we've kind of glossed over this, but but to avoid a contrail is relatively easy. Well, I mean, operationally. Mm -hmm. But the real prize is not to avoid the contrails. The real prize is to be able to avoid the contrails that warm and retain or possibly increase the number of contrails that cool. I'm wondering, is um, um, Ian, is because I find this point very interesting, it raises the question for me, is one thing more difficult than the other? I don't think so. I don't think so. 
You see, if if we if we knew a bit more about how contrails behaved, and of course we're learning all the time now because this is the focus of of a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, an aircraft coming back from North America in the middle of the night could divert uh, into uh, a nice supersaturated region and deliberately make a contrail, which would then drift from night into day and be a warming contrail for the environment. If we could figure out how to do that at will mm. during normal operations, then you know, this there, there doesn't seem to me to be any real reason why this should not work. I know that at a, a recent uh, Royal Error Society conference, I think you mentioned this topic and then someone brought up the idea of geoengineering and the concept of artificially creating cooling clouds. And where do you draw the line between, OK, creating a few cooling contrails and solar radiation management, which is has a lot of predicted uh problems associated with that good question um in a sense kieran the, the geoengineering has already happened because the contrails that are produced today were not there in pre-industrial sky mm -hmm. so if one said take them all out that couldn't be construed as geoengineering that is the antithesis of geoengineering okay because we've returned the planet to its pre-industrial state are you familiar with the term termination shock? Termination shock? Yeah. It's the idea of basically when it's this proposal of solar radiation management, so large-scale intervention of uh, stratospheric aerosol injection. And the, the idea that if we did that on such a huge scale and then took it away, then that would lead to massive rises in temperature. I know that this is obviously probably nowhere near on the scale that you're suggesting, no, 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 I see what you mean. But look, the as I said, the geoengineering has already happened with aviation. We put the contrails in the sky and they weren't there before and they are modifying the climate. Yeah. So taking them away could not ever be construed as geoengineering. It, it has to be the opposite. Yeah. So, OK, all I'm saying is we don't take them all away. We take half of them away. So we're halfway back to where we were. <laughs> I think that's fair. And, and the, be the beauty of this is that, that unlike the other geoengineering problems, if, if it turned out to be a bad thing, we could stop it inside 24 hours. Yeah. You know, and, and the effect would stop immediately. So there's no, there's no risk with this. It's not something that once done cannot be undone. Yeah. It's something that we know can be switched on and switched off at will. So, you know, if that debate did arise, I think aviation's in a good position to counter it. Uh, and you see that the thing is, the thing is, if if we did this, if if we if we retained the coolers and eliminated the warmers, then based on what we know right now, which which may or may not be accurate, but let, let's 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 uh, work on the basis that it's reasonably close that would immediately offset between 10 and 15% of the carbon dioxide radiative forcing because we have we have introduced a cooling a net cooling element where before it was a net warmer that net cooler reduces the total aviation impact so it's it's it is offsetting the legacy co2 and for those two options like warming versus cooling, where do we stand with regards to the readiness level, the technological readiness level, if you want to say, use that term? Because right now everyone is talking about the warming ones and there is a lot of push to um, avoid those. How is it for the cooling ones? Are we, do we have to do more research to also pull that trigger? No, I think it's self-evident, isn't it? That, that if a contrail and a cirrus cloud are in bright sunshine with nothing else to absorb the energy, then it's got to be a cooler. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, all, a child can understand this. It, 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 it's not subtle. You know, the impacts of CO2 are unbelievably subtle. I mean, we all say, oh, yes, yeah, CO2 affects the air. Ask somebody how it does it. 
what's the mechanism? And boy, you'll then see complexity. Uh, you know, it, it's, it doesn't have uncertainty, but my goodness, it has complexity. Whereas with the contrail, you are basically just dealing with a mirror. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a mirror. It couldn't be, it couldn't be easier to explain. Um, everybody's seen a contrail. They know when a contrail is there. They know when a contrail is not there. You know, it, it's it's. So Mark was saying that it's it's potentially easier to predict the climate impact of a contrail than it is to predict the ISSR which it would form in. And if that's correct, then surely that would mean that creating a cooling contrail is is easier than than avoiding a warming one because you can't see what you've avoided if you see what i mean no no you cannot prove a negative i i you know i i'm, I'm right with you there um yeah yes yeah, so that's an interesting question it, but 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 we're not really dealing with with deep scientific issues here are we these are interesting little questions which we could <laughs> do an agreement on almost immediately sure. um you know it's not contentious is it and it's not subject to great uncertainty you know the bottom line for me anyway is that aviation impacts the environment we need to stop that or to reduce it to the greatest extent possible now we've we've run off uh you know making sustainable aviation fuels and and, and you know convincing people you can you can make energy out of virtually nothing that may be true it's certainly going to take a while but here we have a mechanism which a child could understand and which we could implement immediately at no risk to the environment. No, no, you know, if, if it turned out to be wrong, we could stop it. it. It operates at marginal cost and it operates within the existing system. So we don't need a new weather forecasting system. We need the current weather forecasting system to give us a bit more information. We don't need a new kind of aircraft. We just need the aircrew to avoid the ISSR, just like they'd avoid a thunderstorm or you know turbulence. They do this all the time. They don't just plow on because you know computer says go this way. You know they they manage their activity. They they take tactical decisions all the time. This is just another tactical decision. Um, you know and <laughs> as a bonus using satellites you can measure observe whether or not you've been effective so you know if it's working you know if it's just another data point in the weather forecast really isn't it i, I mean you can put it as simple as that isn't it i mean you know we, you, you, they want to know where the turbulence is that's difficult to predict um they know what the winds are doing they know what the temperature is doing um the humidity is a bit of a challenge but then you know, life's full of challenges. They they ought to be they ought to be uh, motivated by this because of the because of the implications that that would have for the environment. You know, we're all focused in the in the same direction, and you know what's stopping it happening is 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 the big question. If it, if if as I've described it, it's so beneficial, it's so obvious, it's so easy. <laughs> then why not? I have a question. Yeah. What is stopping it? Well, <laughs> oh, fun. I, well, if, if I if I if I give you a cynical answer, it would be because there is no money in it. Nobody is going to ask governments for billions of pounds or billions of euros. If I want to get rid of carbon dioxide, I go to the EU for zillions of euros. You know, the Americans go to the U.S. government for trillions of dollars. Um, but if you want to avoid a contrail, <laughs> you know, it's it's peanuts by comparison. And 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 this is a this is a criticism of environmental groups as well. Why are environmental groups not calling for aviation to remove contrails? Well, Finley, Finley, who was here, he, he made a very strong point, uh, so I can only speak for him. I think that he uh, is convinced and also uh, tries to spread the, the message about uh, contrails. It's not been picked up generally, and yet everybody knows about it. You know, in, in, the, in the environmental lobbying world, they know, 
But what they do not do is make a big deal of it. They don't, they, they're not lying down in the road, gluing themselves to buildings, demanding we stop contrails. I suspect, I suspect that it may be because of the potential to offset CO2. Some may be worried that aviation will claim that if they could do that, they don't need to um, move away from fossil fuel. Now, that may be true, but is that of itself a good enough argument? I think not. Aviation should be allowed to minimize its environmental impact to the greatest extent possible. Full stop, end of. The environment says, well, if you keep on making contrails, we'll keep on changing. You know, the global mean temperature will keep on rising. You know, you have to stop what you're doing and you have to stop everything that you're doing that is contributing to that problem, because that's the problem that's changing the weather and that's changing the climate. So what you just said could also be translated to a sentence that uh, uh, stuck with me being, maybe it's too good to be true. That's also something that uh, that you said, right? Oh, uh, yes, it may be. But <clears throat> you see, that the, the, the people who have objected to this, um, and there are people who have objected to it, have said, one, uh, the science is too uncertain, whatever that may mean. Now, okay, we've said the current situation is that um, contrail and contrail-induced cirrus are approximately the equivalent of the CO2. Well, that's a, that's a very big number. Supposing it was only 10% of the CO2, it would still be worth doing. There, there, is, no, there is no number that's so small that you would wish to ignore it in, you know, in, the, in the current situation. So, and supposing the uncertainty goes the other way and it's twice as big as we thought, you know, in which case, <laughs> the uncertainty argument doesn't hold up because provided that the consequence is a negative one, you should be addressing it. Mm. Let's, let's worry about the magnitude. And the second objection, is that, oh, well, if you avoid a contrail, you create more CO2. And this is also wrong because it, it, it's based on the completely incorrect assumption that airlines operate minimum fuel flights. They do not. They operate maximum economic return flights. And that balances the costs of many things. For example, the cost of time, the aircrew costs, uh, the cost of uh, air traffic um, services, it, it, they, they differ very greatly between different regions. And so you, you may reroute your entire flight in order to save money on air traffic fees. Um, there are costs with being late at your departure or late at your arrival. There are all sorts of issues all of which, when optimized, mean that the fuel is not absolute minimum. So what you need to do is to build this into flight planning now so that you avoid the contrails, but you do not increase the fuel requirement. That may cost the airline a little more per flight, but because you can, you can transfer your costs between fuel and time and other sectors, you can also transfer the cost of a contrail avoidance away from fuel and into an increased cost in the other areas. Mm. I hope that made sense. But you, you see what I mean? That it is, does not follow absolutely that avoiding a contrail increases fuel. That is not a valid scientific statement. I knew that you were going to compliment all of our guests so far by that point, uh, being that we need the right baseline to compare it to, you know, not apple um, right. with, with uh, oranges. So I'm, I'm glad you said that. However, something that others have also said um, in the past is this like cynical analysis of maybe there's no money in it, right? And all of the explanations now we're, we're like circling and the circle gets closer to the point of, okay, when or how would regulation play into this? And I remember you making the point that airlines 
should maybe not wait until you know any regulation is made. We earlier mentioned demand management. That would be, of course, a very harsh interference. But even um, putting a price tag on, on contract avoidance, maybe airlines do not want to wait because there might be risks attached to Corsia or, or the ETS and they could mitigate the, those risks by implementing that. Maybe you could shed some light on that aspect. Well, I mean, this, this goes back to the moral argument that if you know that you are doing something bad to the environment, there is a there is a moral requirement to do something about it, not simply to ignore it and keep going, but to do something about it. Now, I I believe that that the contrail management argument could be repackaged as a highly positive narrative for aviation. Currently, aviation's narrative is completely negative. That need not be the case because contrail management offers us the opportunity to put some good news out there. Now that alone would be good for the for the airlines. Just the PR alone would be good. Um, but you know, it's as I said earlier, aviation airline businesses are pretty slim margin businesses. If what I said before about avoiding a contrail would under current circumstances push up the cost to the airline a little bit in its model they would not like that you know that would be something that that unless unless the pr and and the the general narrative could be changed that might be considered worth the extra expense if you ignore the narrative argument then you may say well of course they they won't sacrifice the profit And that then would require some regulation, because if, if they won't do it willingly, then perhaps they need to be forced. And forced, you know, that's that's regulation, isn't it? That means, you know, you, you must not, on pain of fines or something. And I guess that means that airlines who have pivoted to uh, sort of voluntary control management, when, well, when regulation does inevitably come about, then they'll be the ones who have already made the advancement. I think we're nearer to this happening than, than, than you know, we really believe because I suspect what's happening is people are beginning to realize this and thinking about it, that they're not showing their, their hand yet, but suddenly they'll all go together. I mean, we know that, that um, Satavia, for example, uh, will provide um, flight plans which can avoid contrails. We know that flight keys can do it. What they're doing at the moment is they tend to analyze historic records. They're not actually working with tomorrow's flights. They're telling you what would have happened if they'd uh, done this on yesterday's flights. But the tools, the tools are available. They, they are, people have developed them and they could be deployed quite quickly. You know, so it's, it's something that may suddenly take off, for, <laughs> for want of a better phrase. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's it's um every day that goes by every day that we produce those nighttime contrails we are damaging the environment you know yeah. we shouldn't do it every day is wasted you know when you look at co2 you can think well it's 10 20 30 years in the future so we don't have to get worked up now but th the truth is on individual flights it's not the co2 it's The contrails, it, the contrails is 50 times the impact of the CO2 of that flight. Mm. Of course, the reason CO2 is important is because you've got the integral of all the flights still in the atmosphere. You add an extra flight, you only add a tiny drop to the CO2 pool. And therefore, it's the contrails that are the massive, the, by far the biggest um, contributor to radiative forces. So it's, uh, I suspect that we'll get this in the not too distant future. And I hope we'll get it. Well, isn't it as early as 2025 that we have to start, well, airlines will have to start measuring their control climate impact? I, yeah, yeah. If 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 they don't manage to, uh, you know, get a get out or an exemption or an exclusion. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as early as next year. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's that's European airspace, isn't it? I mean, the real, the real place to start, the, the best place to start, is over the North Atlantic. That's where you get the biggest payoff, and that's where it's easiest to, 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 to do the avoidance. You know, uh, 
too much traffic in the skies over Europe make it a very, very big call. Not to say it's impossible, but it's it's more difficult. But when you're out over the ocean, flying right through those ISSRs, uh, you know, it's it's a perfect place to start the uh, you know to start the uh, the management of those things, or just trials at least, at the very least. So yes, try, but but again, you see, trials are really about can the systems that we have cope with an extra criterion yeah it would, today we will avoid contrails now what does that mean for for the uh flight planners what does that mean for the air traffic controllers etc etc um and yeah they should be doing dummy runs right now they should be running parallel exercises to say well okay we had today's flights but supposing we put the extra criterion on top what would that have done Earlier, I, I um, started a question by uh, basically laying out, okay, you could do pre-tactical and uh, tactical deviations and, you know, different kinds. And I still ask myself the question, what about the scalability of, of these things? How do you look at this? Is it just, okay, once the trials work, we can do a fleet-wide rollout? You now mentioned that, for example, the region of North Atlantic would be a good place to start. Um, how do you see this scaling up of this... Uh, Contrail management system. Well, I, I see. I don't. I don't see a problem at all. I mean, it's because we're using the systems that are currently in place. You know, with 24 hours before a flight, a flight plan is developed for the airline, which is the airline's preferred um, trip for the for the following day. This gets filed with the air traffic provider, and they try. As, this is as I understand it. They try and accommodate the airline's wishes. But the flight that's actually flown is the one that they specify. Now that's okay, that takes us up to um, breaks off for takeoff. Once the aircraft is in the sky, the captain is the, is the ultimate authority. And you know, so you can have your strategic avoidance, if you like, all in place, but You know, the crew manage the fuel as they're going along for various reasons. Um, and so they can they can also play a tactical role as well. Nobody who who isn't in the current system is involved. You know, it's a it's a let's say let's say nobody ever heard of clear air turbulence and suddenly somebody found it and started researching it and then said, well, obviously aircraft will wish to avoid it. I mean, how has that happened? You know, you try and predict it. Uh, if you can't predict it, aircraft that experience it tell aircraft behind that there's clear air turbulence and, and they, they manage it both strategically and tactically. Well, cross out the, the phrase clear air turbulence and put in ISSR. What's the difference? You know, it's, it's, it's at full scale immediately. doesn't need to be grown. The, the other thing, just before we go, is is that the pilots, at least the ones I talk to, uh, and I've 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 presented to pilots associations, and the feedback I get is that they say, "Yep, we think we can do it. We're happy to to implement it if the airlines give us the green light." So the very people who would do this want to give it a try. What more could you want? That's pretty unusual in, in environment because where else do you get people who are actually directly in contact with the problem saying, yeah, I can, I can do something. Hmm. You know, that's another big plus for this activity. If they were saying, no, it's all far too difficult, that would be a different story. But that isn't the case. The pilots I've spoken to have, have been very accommodating of this idea. of it's, it's something that is just so natural to them anyway. They very often have to fly maybe a thousand, two thousand feet diversion. This isn't anything out, out of the ordinary for them. And and they've got skin in the game, of course, because it's their profession, their livelihoods, their futures. And if I was a pilot right now, I'd be very uncomfortable about about backing my future on SAF or hydrogen or any shaped aeroplane that that purports of the environmental problem because that might not happen yeah you know? so, uh, i'd like plan b and i'd be i'd like plan b to be under my personal control mm -hmm. 
see, then you've got huge buy-in, haven't you? I mean, crikey, it, it's hard to imagine a more symbiotic situation. That's a very positive notion, I think, to, to wrap up this uh, conversation here. We appreciate it so much, you taking the time already. And uh, we have this tradition, you know, the podcast doesn't exist for too long, but uh, you might have noticed that we passed on a question to you from Mark Shapiro and uh, we enjoyed your answer. Now, you have the opportunity to pass on the question to our next speaker. This will be a spontaneous kind of thing. We'll, we'll give you some seconds to think about it. And our next speaker will be, or guest, uh, so to say, will be Bethan Owen which I'm sure you know, or you probably met uh, like multiple times already. Oh, I know. Could be any scientific question, could be any just fun kind of question, but maybe anything comes to your mind. Here we go. Why are we not doing contrail management now? <laughs> <laughs> Once more, a very, you know, complex question condensed into a very uh, simple back of the cigarette packs kind of uh, version. Um, that's something we take on. Perfect. Okay. Thanks a lot for joining us, Ian. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, Ian. See you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye.